If you've been around my channel for a while, you know that I've been a long time proponent of purchasing a pre-owned or refurbished 2013 to 2015 MacBook Pro 15 inch in the past, you know, three to four years. But times have recently changed and Apple has finally given you and I a decent reason to buy a new Apple MacBook Pro. Well, let's get rocking. <laughs> Now, if you're new to the channel, my name is Benji Kaiser. This is where you're going to find the best tech and tools for creative professionals. Also, if you're curious about the exact pricing and availability of maybe a 2015 MacBook Pro or the new MacBook Pro M1, you can head down into the description below and click one of those links. Now, if you do make a purchase of those links, I will get a small commission, but at no extra cost to you. And that's what keeps this channel alive and the helpful content coming your way. Now, with respect to your time, um, this is not going to be a complete in-depth review. Now, I'm going to talk about the reasonings behind why I recommended the 2015 MacBook Pro for so long and why I now recommend getting the 2000 and 20 or you know 21, whatever you want to call it, MacBook Pro M1. So if you're here because you're somebody who really wants to know about their gear, why they're making a purchase, and you really want to be informed, then this is the video for you. If you just want somebody to tell you to go buy the new MacBook Pro M1, I'll tell you right now, go buy the new MacBook Pro M1 and use the link in the description below. But that's not what this is about. And I'm playing, I'm having fun, but I, I'm, what I'm saying is I want you guys to be informed on the gear you're buying. And so that's why this video has been made. Otherwise, I'd let it rest. But I really wanted to dive into this. Let's get going. Coming in this video is a discussion on the best way to spend your money, performance benchmarks in photo and video editing, simulated benchmarks, plus some additional specs such as color gamut range, color accuracy. So stay tuned throughout the whole video because every section is going to bring you a lot of value. First and most obvious reason for Apple's terrible design flaw in the butterfly keyboard. That's why I initially started recommending the 2015 MacBook Pro because they switched over to the butterfly keyboard and really it was just a horrible experience for many people. That and through that process, they weren't improving the performance of their laptops. So I knew many, many users and still know many users that had to have their butterfly keyboards serviced by Apple three to four times in the matter of a few years. Now, this was not an anomaly. This was not something randomly happening. This was very commonplace. Um, so in 2019, when Apple brought back the scissor switch keyboard, I was really excited. But to me, this still was not a good enough reason to switch back to buying the new MacBook Pros, especially for graphic designers, digital artists, and photographers that don't need a beast video editing or motion graphics capable laptop. Okay, so at this point, um, it was still not reasonably equipped, in my opinion, the 13 inch MacBook Pro, um, for costing roughly $1,700. And for a 16 inch, uh, you'd put back roughly $2,200. Now, that was all before tax. Okay, so to me, the cost was not worth the performance increase unless you were a 4K video editor. Then, in that case, I would encourage you to lean towards the, you know, that 15 inch model at the time, or now the new 16 inch model with its suitable i7-9750H processor. But in that time period for designers and for digital artists and photographers, um, the 13 inch model didn't pack a big enough punch. And, you know, more so the 15 inch model had the bad keyboard. Okay. So a refurb 2015 MacBook Pro 15 inch was a perfect option for most Adobe Design Suite users. It was color accurate. It had four cores and eight threads and an i7 processor with 16 gigs of RAM. Um, it was just a really well suited laptop. And I have a model right here in front of me, as you can see. Okay. And it had plenty of power with the integrated graphics for digital artists, graphic designers, and photographers. Okay. So for the use cases that they needed, it was a great fit. And the best part is you could pick up this laptop here for around a thousand dollars. So it was just such a better deal. Um, and it was depending on the condition you could find it in, you know. So for the release day, of the 2015 MacBook Pro, this laptop here went for about $2,000, okay? So I'm just kind of giving you some full picture context, okay? Um, now, accounting for inflation, the 2020 Apple MacBook Pro 16 inch is almost to the dollar the exact same price. So basically, you buy something here, your money is worth less here, so then the price increases in, with inflation, uh, but with, with inflation, 
accounted for, it's almost the same price. Okay. So why does inflation matter in this review and why um, would I no longer recommend a refurbished 2015 MacBook Pro? I mean, what's the correlation? Now it matters because no matter when you buy the base model of a MacBook Pro, historically over the past decade, they cost the exact same price. So that means when you buy is equally as important as what you buy. Okay. So from 2016, to 2019, before the launch of the 15 inch model with the i7-9750H, we watched as Apple continually dropped the ball on the performance development while flopping around on the deck like a fish out of water with features that brought, you know, to me, nearly zero benefit. Okay, so their beloved touch bar and their butterfly keyboards were just they were kind of silly and ridiculous. It did not help me in my daily workflow and they were time spent in my opinion that was not useful. Um, now they still offered an underpowered lineup of the 13 inch laptop while the 15 inch model did get a little boost in performance during that time period. But because the 15 inch model was moving past the $2,000 price point and contained a terribly designed keyboard deck and a useless touch bar, many people were left scrambling for different options. Should they try and save some money and get the 13 inch model while Apple got their act together. But when you saw the, you know, what you could get for around 1700 ish dollars, it was a joke and it was a waste of money. Okay. So that's why I started recommending the 2013 to 2015 models of the MacBook Pro 15 inch. Okay. And I personally picked up a 2015 15 model in 2018 and have been getting great results with this laptop. So it was the perfect solution for me and many others in light of what Apple was doing in their design house, in their wheelhouse and what they were working on. And I'm sure they were even working back, you know, on the M1 chip at that time. It was just probably super secret, but I digress. So to prove my point, I started benchmarking um, in 2019, the 13 inch MacBook Pro with an i5 processor. 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage. So that would put you back roughly $1,700 or $1,699 at the time. Whereas in 2015 MacBook Pro, 15 inch model, i7 processor, 16 gigs of RAM, 512 gig SSD would put you back roughly a thousand ish dollars, $1,100. So in Puget Systems Photoshop benchmark, the older 2015 model beat out the newer 2019 model with an i5 processor by 41 points all day long. Now you might say, of course it did. It was a better processor. And to that, I would say exactly. So pay less and get more. So to very briefly recap a long story short, because I just told a long story, let's make it short. Buying a 2015 MacBook Pro would get you an equally suitable and larger color accurate screen, better keyboard, better performance, better speakers, and the ability to upgrade your storage drive and RAM while the 2019 model did not allow that any longer because of the soldered motherboard. All, all those components were soldered to the motherboard or soldered, however you'd like to say it. So that left us waiting. So Apple launched the MacBook Pro M1 and changed everything for the entry level lineup. And let me repeat myself there so as to not get any delusions, the entry level lineup. So if you're wanting this laptop to replace every high performance computer on the market, do note that it will not. The current MacBook Pro M1 is Apple's very delayed response to poor performance over the past five years for digital artists, designers, um, and photographers. So which was indeed worth the wait, I will point out. Um, and so it shows, it's shown very good promise for designers, artists, and photographers, as well as creators interested in 1080p and some very light 4K video editing. So starting off in the Photoshop benchmark, you can see that the M1 outpaces the 2015 MacBook Pro by just over 100 points. But the 2019 MacBook Pro 16 inch is still beating out the M1 by over 200 points. My point is confirmed that this initial launch of Apple Silicon was not aimed at a prosumer level market, but getting Apple back in the game for its mid-range consumer, such as the digital artist, designer, and photographer. Now, I don't mean mid-range like they don't have enough money or they just they, they don't know what they're doing. That's not what I mean. I mean, they don't need the massive performance of a prosumer video editor or motion designer. I hope that's, that's clear. And that is exactly what they did. They brought their game back. Now, according to Denard Scaling and Moore's Law, the 100 points was about a 1.5 times 
increase in performance. And if you want to know more about that, I filmed a full video on why the MacBook Pro M1 is so good and it's so good in its category. And I'll link that up in the YouTube cards above so you can check it out after this video is over. Now regarding color accuracy and color gamut range, Apple made some improvements here as well. The 2020 MacBook Pro M1 comes with a 13.3 inch retina display that can reach 303 nits at full brightness. The M1 pulls off some solid color accuracy, snagging a color gamut range of 100% sRGB, 89% Adobe RGB, and 100% DCI-P3 at an average Delta E of 1.18. Now, the 2015 MacBook Pro comes with a 15.6 inch retina display that can reach 362 nits at full brightness with a color gamut range of 97% sRGB, 77% Adobe RGB, and 79% DCI-P3, all at an average Delta E of 2.11. Okay, so here we see a better Delta E rating and slightly better color gamut range. So great improvements there. Now concerning the on-the-go capability of these two laptops, the 2015 MacBook Pro weighs in at 4.49 pounds at a thickness of 0.71 inches thick, whereas the new MacBook Pro M1 weighs in at 3 pounds at a thickness of 0.61 inches thick. So it's a little bit lighter, a little bit smaller, obviously 13 inch versus 15 inch, but we're talking, you know, price point and uh, performance levels a lot of times in this review. Concerning the battery life, the original 2015 MacBook Pro would get roughly nine hours of web browsing and about five to seven hours of design and video editing battery life out of its 99.5 watt hour battery. But if you're picking up a pre-owned model with the original battery, you would now be looking at roughly, give or take, six hours of web browsing and three and a half to four and a half hours of creative tasks due to, you know, the deterioration or just the wearing out of the battery. Whereas the MacBook Pro M1 will get roughly 14 hours of web browsing battery life and about 10 to 11 hours of design and video editing out of its 58.2 watt hour battery. So it is an improvement in performance of the consumption of the battery, which is super awesome. Now, if you're enjoying this video and getting some value and you wanna save some money on your next laptop or desktop PC purchase, then you don't wanna miss out on my texting community, 850-306-4644. A lot of things will be happening there, but most importantly, I'm excited about the weekly tech deals I will be sending exclusively to my texting community. Every week, you'll get a fresh lineup of the latest tech deals on discounted laptops delivered straight to your phone via text plus a few ways to engage directly with me, ask me questions, whatever it might be over there. 850-306-4644. I hope to see you there in text. Now let's take a look at the performance between the 2015 MacBook Pro and the 2020 MacBook Pro M1. The 2015 MacBook Pro I'm reviewing comes with the Intel i7-4980HQ processor, the Intel Iris Pro 1536 megabyte graphics integrated, 16 gigs of RAM and one terabyte SSD. Whereas the MacBook Pro M1 comes with Apple's M1 chip, eight cores and eight threads. The GPU is an eight core GPU with 16 core neural engine and eight gigs of unified RAM with a 512 gig SSD. Kicking things off, we're going to jump into the simulated benchmark test to check out how each of these laptops handles Cinebench and Geekbench. This will be an interesting head to head because the 2015 MacBook Pro has four cores and eight threads, whereas the MacBook Pro M1 comes with eight cores and eight threads inside of Apple's new M1 chip. And here, as you can see, it is not even a competition. The older CPU plus less cores and threads gets stomped on by the new MacBook Pro M1 chip. Moving on to motion design, I'm using Puget Systems After Effects Benchmark. Now, as far as After Effects is concerned, whenever I run the benchmark for Puget Systems in the 2015 MacBook Pro, it would start up the test, it would take about, it would make about a third of the way through, and then it would just shut off. It would just give me an error and then it would quit the test. So historically, I've never recommended the 2015 MacBook Pro with integrated graphics for After Effects. Now, perhaps with dedicated graphics, you might get better performance, but I have never been able to get my hands on one of those um, or purchase one, whatever you, might, whatever you might say. However, the new MacBook Pro M1 was able to get a solid score in After Effects at a 641. 
So please note, however, that the MacBook Pro M1 After Effects results came from a friend of mine with a 16 gig model. I was unable to run the Puget Systems test on the 8 gig model. It would say like insufficient RAM, like you need at least 12 gigs of RAM to run the After Effects test. So I will say if you do want the MacBook Pro M1 for After Effects, I personally recommend upgrading to 16 gigs of RAM. Now onto my favorite benchmark test, video editing. And this is where things get interesting. First, I'm going to start off with a playback test. For this test, I'm going to take a nine minute 4K clip add in some motion graphics and then play it back in the timeline at full quality. This full clip contains 16,177 frames in total with 7,240 of those frames being motion graphics. Now during this test, the 2015 MacBook Pro saw drop frame rates as follows. At full quality, 14,459 frames dropped. At half quality, 7,793 frames dropped. And at fourth quality, 810 frames dropped. So this is not a 4K video editing computer. I've, I've said that many times. Um, if you wanna edit 4K footage, get something else. Um, this thing can handle 1080p, and I've handled 1080p projects with it, and it's, it's fairly, fairly good, um, but it's not a 4K video editing computer. I've not ever recommended it for that. During this test, the 2020 MacBook Pro M1 saw drop frame rates as follows. At full quality, 5,481 frames. At half quality, 375 drop frames. And at fourth quality, zero drop frames. So if you're going to be playing back and editing 4K footage, then do note that I, I was, like I said, I was never an advocate for the 2015 MacBook Pro with integrated graphics. Just didn't have the punch that uh, video editors need in this day and age. And it still doesn't to this day. Now, I've been able to edit the 1080p, like I said, and it's fairly frustration free. So as far as the MacBook Pro M1 is concerned though, it's getting triple the smoothness of playback at full quality. Um, so if you're considering the MacBook Pro M1 for 4K video editing, I would edit at half or fourth quality for optimal smoothness and performance. But to be totally honest, I would lean towards having this laptop as like an on the go 1080p and 4K light 4K video editing machine as it doesn't pack a punch to be like your full on rig for large 4K projects. Um, take it for what it is. That's my that's my uh, assessment of this. Now concerning that I was only running Premiere Pro during these tests, you may get slightly higher drop frame rates while multitasking, um, but you can easily switch to half or fourth quality to get smooth playback um, as you're adding more uh, tabs and doing more multitasking. Now concerning the rendering of the motion effects, I was able to render out the 7,240 frames in just eight minutes and 39 seconds using the 2015 MacBook Pro and only a bit faster at seven minutes and 43 seconds for the MacBook Pro M1. Moving on to the 4K export test, I'm gonna take a nine minute 4K clip, place it into Premiere Pro and then export both out at 1080p and 4K YouTube settings. The MacBook Pro M1 was able to export the 4K to 4K footage in 36 minutes and 45 seconds and the MacBook Pro M1 five minutes and 51 seconds, substantially faster. 2015 MacBook Pro 4K to 1080p export was five minutes and 45 seconds, and the MacBook Pro M1 was nine minutes and 15 seconds. Until the MacBook Pro 13 M1 was launched, I would have fully led designers and artists and photographers, plus maybe some light 1080p editors for basic YouTube content to pick up the 2015 MacBook Pro. Um, it was more affordable, faster, and better designed than the current offerings from 2016 to 2019, as far as you know, what you could pick up at an estimated price point of around $1,000. So then finally, Apple stepped it up. Um, they really hit it out of the park with this one. And now with a MacBook Pro M1, you have a great laptop for entry-level video editors, Adobe Design Suite users. Um, this is a laptop that is reasonably priced by Apple standards, performs great on the test bench, has slightly improved color gamut range, moved back to the Swizzer Switch keyboard and it has a beast battery life. So for these reasons, I no longer recommend the 2015 MacBook Pro. You can pick up a MacBook Pro M1, unless you really want that 15 inch screen. And maybe now that the MacBook Pro M1 is out, you might be able to get one of these 2015 models for a little bit less money. Um, and then you'll be happy as a peach. So really, as always, the decision's up to you. If you're curious about the exact pricing of each of the models or where you can buy a pre-owned MacBook Pro, I'll link those up in the description below. And as always, those are affiliate links. So if you do use them, I'll get a small commission, but at no extra cost to you, and that's okay this channel alive and the helpful content coming your way. If you want more content about the MacBook Pro M1 or the 2015 MacBook Pro, you can click or tap the screen over here. Otherwise, keep editing, keep creating, keep designing. My name is Benji Kaiser, and I'll see you here in the next video.